device and equipment. Even now there are those of you who are able to see, very lightly and invisible. But I shall soon increase this anointing in you, said God. And for those of you who desire, I understand that I am the God who gives gifts to you. Not only will I anoint eyes, I will anoint ears, noses, lips, and touch, that all of those senses might be exercised in the use of my power. But understand this, this is given to you to help the church. This is given to you to bless my bride. This is given to you that you might walk together with me in pushing back the darkness. Never use this for self gain. Never use this to hurt anyone in the body of Christ. Never use this to cut down someone in, in, my, in my church. For as you do so, if you will, you will inherit my displeasure, said God. Always be careful, be responsible for the gifts that I have given you. For what you will see is going to be a taste of that which is to come. And as you prove yourself faithful, and as you continue to walk, I will cause the intensity, the frequency, and the power of this to increase in your life, said the Lord our God. Amen. Well, praise be to God, as we have come to the last Sunday of the Epiphany, uh, the Word is preparing us also for the season of Lent. Now, how many of you enjoy Christmas? How many of you like Easter? How many of you, your favorite is Lent? <laughs> we don't really like Lent, right? We would rather feast than fast, all right? Uh, we would rather be happy rather than be sad or sober, but Lent is needed. There is a scripture in, in, the, in the book of Psalms that says, uh, be still and know that I am God, okay? And when we come before the Lord our God, what's inside is seen. And sometimes we don't like what is being seen. Well, God is not doing that. Not, he's not showing us those things. To make us feel bad. God doesn't want us to feel bad. You understand what I'm saying? Heaven is a happy place. There is no sadness. There is no loneliness. Okay? There is no regret. It's just one big happy place. And uh, there's nothing there that will make you feel miserable. Nothing there that will make you feel sad. Nothing there that will grieve you. So, no, God doesn't do those things to grieve us, but rather, He shows us those things that He might show us He can free us from those things. You understand what I'm saying? God wants us to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. God created us, and, and, and He wanted us to uh, represent Him in the world. In, in the book of Genesis, when God created man, the Bible very clearly says, God said, let us make man in our, what, image. In other words, when whole, the whole of creation looks at Adam, they would take a double take. Oh, it's you, Adam. I thought it was God. See, God wanted man to represent him and to reflect him. Well, we know that that image was marred when he, said, when, when, when he sinned. But because Jesus Christ came back again, he restored to us everything that was lost. And as we continue to walk with the Lord, the Spirit of God begins to work within us. Uh, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God reminds us of who He is. The sacraments help us to, uh, to live out what God has given unto us. That's why the book of Philippians says, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. That means being serious in the presence of God. Okay? With fear and trembling, this is not something to laugh about. This is something that is important to God. God, the moment we made our, our faith in God through Jesus Christ, we became children of God. But God wants us to grow up from little children to sons and daughters into the kingdom. Amen? I mean, as little children, we do not know how to rule and to reign. Okay, but God said in his holy word that Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. A lord 
is someone who has authority over a dominion, over a territory. God wants us to be able to do that. But as long as we're thinking like little children, okay, then we don't know. We, we have not yet matured. See, as little children, we're only thinking about our own needs. We're thinking only of those things that would bless us. We're thinking only of those things that would make us uh, achieve our dreams. But, but what God wants is for us to grow up and become mature sons and daughters that we can say to him, Father, we would like to take our position in the kingdom of God as your sons, as your daughters, and as your partners in the kingdom of God. We're not just interested in getting blessed. We are interested in bringing your blessings to others. We are grateful, Father, you have healed us. Now, we will bring your healing to our generation. We are grateful, Father, you have delivered us. Now, we will bring your deliverance to the others. We are grateful, Father, that you have prospered us. Now, we will bring your provision and prosperity to others. You understand what I'm saying? Once upon a time, we were recipients of the blessing of God. But because we've been growing in Christ, now we become uh, agents of that blessing to others. Because after all, that is what I, that is the blessing of Abraham. Let me ask you this. How are you today? Yes. Blessed to be a blessing. That was the blessing that God said to Abraham. Walk before me, Abraham, and I will make my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. And one of the blessings, he says, I will bless you and you will become a blessing to many nations. Amen? Now, in the book of Galatians, it says, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, then we have become Abraham's descendants. You understand what I'm saying? According to the scriptures in the book of Galatians, now we have inherited the blessing of Abraham. And what's that? That's what we keep on saying. Blessed to be a blessing. See, we're not saying that because it sounds good. We're not saying that because it's a gimmick. We're not saying that because we're adopting that as a slogan. But we are saying that because that is what God said. Right? And the Bible very clearly says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we, we repeat what God says about us because sometimes we forget. Sometimes when the problems of life come to us, we begin to focus on the problems. We forget about the promises of God. Instead of being hopeful, we begin to despair. Instead of having faith, we begin to be in fear. Okay? Instead of... Uh, having a sense of expectation of good things, we become desperate. We need to remember what God said. Remember, our God will never fail us. Amen? Okay, let me go to the lesson. <laughs> There's so many things that God wanted to say to us. Okay, let's start with our theme. Purify and be yourself. What a heavy word. <laughs> What does theosis mean? <laughs> theosis is the process of being uh, conformed into the image of God. All right? That's simply what it means. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church have another word to describe this. It's uh, being deified. Again, another heavy word. But it simply means that as we continually obey God, as we continually walk in His steps, as we continually uh, apply and operate in the principles of the kingdom of God, that we're learning in God, then step by step, God is uh, shaping us into His own image. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, St. Paul said in one of his epistles, I think it's, it's somewhere in Corinthians, he says, uh, You are my epistles. Okay, Colossians is an epistle, Philippians is an epistle, okay, uh, Ephesians is, a, is an epistle. What he's saying is, 
because you are obeying God and you're walking so closely with God, people begin to see what God is like. It's like they're reading an epistle. You are my walking epistle. Amen? As a matter of fact, we, we find in the book of Acts, the word Christian was coined because there were people in that particular place, they were acting like Christ, they were speaking like Christ, they were living like Christ, and so the people of that place called them Christians or little Christs. You understand what I'm saying? I think we understand that when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to our uh, entertainment world. Once upon a time, uh, when there were just two superstars, <laughs> we had the Noranians and we had the Bluemanians. Okay. The Noranians, they're the ones who know everything about Noral Art, and the, uh, the Romanians, they're the ones who know everything, and they'll uh, uh, attend all the uh, uh, services, uh, not services, concerts <laughs> of Vilma. So they're, they're named that way, okay? Well, basically, we want to be where Christ is. Amen? We want Christ to be number one in our lives. Amen? As a matter of fact, we want Christ to be the center of our lives, the center around which our priorities revolve. He's our son. And we're like his planet going our way. He's the center of our being. Okay? And so we, we, we try to think like him. We try to act like him. We try to live like him. If we find he forgives, we want to forgive. If we find that he prays, we want to pray. If we find that he brings the presence of the Father, we want that also. Okay? So, we are little Christ in the sense that we are called Christians. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? But today, it became like a title only. So, some people say, why are you a Christian? What do you mean that you're a Christian? Oh, I was not born a Muslim. It's not that. You are a Christian. Because you have faith in God through Jesus Christ. And you're trying to live your life according to the principles of the kingdom of God. Amen? Are you learning something from this? You seem very fun. Are you already in Lent? <laughs> okay. Let's go to the lesson for today. The many readings that we have, of the many lessons of, of the many readings we have, uh, I believe this is what God is saying to us. Let us ascend with God that we may enter into the purposes of God. Let us ascend with God that we may enter into the purposes of God. And we have our gospel in Mark chapter 9, verse 2 to 9. Uh, Three things I'm about to share with you. The first thing, basing this on verse verses two to four. Go to the mountain top with God. Go to the mountain top with God. Okay, we'll come back to that. Second thing I'd like to share with you, I'm basing this on verses five to seven. Heed the word of God. Heed the word of God. And then the third thing from verse 8 to 9, bring his presence, purposes, principles, and power to the world. Bring his presence, purposes, principles, and power to the world. Okay, let's go back to our first thought. Go to the mountaintop with God. Let me just read verse 2 to verse 4 of Mark chapter 9. Okay? It says here, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no longer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, okay? Now, one of the things that we need to understand, this mountain is not just a symbolic mountain. It's a real mountain. 
when uh, my wife and I we went to Israel last year, right? Uh, we went to we, we saw the Mount of Transfiguration. We don't know exactly where Jesus stood, okay? We don't know exactly where uh, he rested with his disciples, but supposedly it was uh, pointed out to us this was the Mount of Transfiguration. So it's a real mountain. And so what am I talking about? Am I asking you to find uh, a real mountain to go to a mountaintop somewhere like uh, Mayon? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. But when I talk about going on a mountaintop with God, I'm saying that we should ascend to the presence of God Almighty. Okay? We are so used to asking God to come down to us. Oh God, bless us with your presence. Oh God, send down your glory. Oh God, let your fire come upon us. And you know what? God will do it. You understand what I'm saying? God will do it. He meets us in our valleys. He meets us at our lowest point. Okay? There are many people who came to the Lord in the middle of their, uh, shall we say, tribulation. For example, I'm thinking of uh, Bishop Frank Constantino. He was one of the bishops of the CEC. But before he became a bishop, he was a gangster. He was a criminal. Okay? Uh, he was involved in uh, cheating, deceiving, and hurting other people. And so he got imprisoned one day. It was supposed to be a life imprisonment. But while he was in prison, he started thinking about his life. And he started calling out to the Lord. And the Lord met him in prison. You understand what I'm saying? And he got converted in prison. And he said, Lord, I serve the devil outside. I will serve you inside the prison. So he was set. He was thinking, since I'm incarcerated, I'll never get out. I'll just trust God. And I'll make the most of my time here, and I'll serve God here. God had other plans for him. The pardon that was not supposed to be uh, a part of the package was given to him. And he got out, and he was true to his word. And he started serving God. He met with uh, uh, Archbishop Adler. Eventually, he became one of the bishops of the CEC. And he has a ministry connected to him, uh, Bridges. It's basically... Uh, a ministry where prisoners, you know, they're about to be released into the real world. The problem is that many of the prisoners are in prison for about 20 years, 10 years. They don't know the developments that have happened. They don't know the kind of life that is found outside. Okay? They might have seen this on television, but they really have no idea. So they don't know how to blend in. So he has this particular ministry where before they're released into the world, they come to this particular place here. They attend church, they learn skills, they get to meet, they get to meet people on a limited basis, and then when they are ready, they are released into the world and become good citizens. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? So he met the Lord. I mean, the Lord came to him at the lowest point of his life. So God is not someone who would say, okay, if you want me to meet you, you have to come to my office all the time. If we ask God to come to us, he comes. If we ask God for help at the lowest point of our lives, he comes. Do you understand what I'm saying? But then we need to understand, scripture also says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Right? Right? We only want God drawing near to us. We need to understand God is waiting for us also to draw near to him. In the book of Revelations, we find St. John the Divine says, I saw a door in heaven and I heard the voice come up here. Okay. And he ascended into the presence of God Almighty. We need to understand that we need to come up to God also. Okay. Now, there is a scripture that we are familiar with. It's in the book of Hebrews. He says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? That you might find mercy and grace to help 
in time of need. Take note what God is saying. He's saying, come into my courtroom. Okay? So we ask him to come down, but he's also inviting us to come up to him. You understand what I'm saying? And Jesus Christ said it this way, but you, when you pray, take note, he did not say, but you, if you pray. No, he says, but you, when you pray, that means he assumes you will pray. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room and meet with your father in secret. See, when we pray, we ascend before the presence of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Hello? When we celebrate the Eucharist, I know your eyes, your ears, your bodily senses tell you we are here. But do you know that when we hold the Eucharist, we ascend into the presence of God? We only see each other. But do you know at the table of the Lord, the church that is in heaven is also gathered there? Because this altar is just a copy of the real altar. Where do we get that idea? God said to Moses, I'll show you heaven. And he says, remember everything. And I want you to make copies of what you've seen there. I want you to make an altar which is a copy of the altar that is in heaven. So whatever we're doing here, we're doing, they're doing there also. You understand what I'm saying? Amen? How many of you have been abroad? Okay? We know that if it's morning here, in some places it's not morning, right? Right? Like if you're going to go to New York right now, what time is it right now? It's 9.46? It's around 9.46 Saturday evening there. So I keep joking with them. I keep telling them, if the rapture happens, I'll tell you in advance. We'll get it first. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? All right? And so uh, it says uh, there are different time zones, right? But eternity, we're all there together. Right now, physical world, we have different time zones. You know, somebody asked me, uh, what does those, uh, is this a symbol of the Holy Trinity? This, well, if it's a symbol of the Trinity, it's a poor symbol because these two other points are not the same. Right? Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. If it's going to be a symbol of Trinity, they have to be of the same height. Right? does bring out the thought of the Trinity, but I'd like for you to see that one of them is a symbol of the church triumphant. The church triumphant is the church that is already residing in heaven. Okay? People have served God and they've died. They're there. They're called the church triumphant. This other one, you can interchange them, all right? The other one is a symbol of the church militant. The church militant is the church that is still down here on the earth. We are the church that, you know, God is using in order to war with the enemy. We're the church that God is using to gain territory for the kingdom of God. And as you can see, there are two, you know, uh, our strength, he's, it's imagine God upholding us like that. Imagine these two arms. We all find our strength, our source, our support in God. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? So we need to understand that, church. Uh, there is a heaven and there is an earth. There is a visible world and there is an invisible world. Put your hand like that, right in front of your eyes. Put your hand like that. Do you see anything in between? If you're looking at it through the, through the visible world, no, there's nothing in between. 
It's only, and we know by physics, we know by science, it's only air. And we say it's kind of nothing, right? But if God would open our eyes and we would suddenly see into the invisible world, we call that the spirit realm or the spirit world, there's something in between. And I can't tell you what it is. It might be an angel, it might be light, it might be colors that are swirling. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? All right? But what I'm trying to say is this, that uh, when Jesus Christ went up there, he was now transfigured. And basically what this is saying to us is that we need to come to God. Give of ourselves to God. Have a mountaintop experience with him. And, and when we do, we are allowing the Spirit of God to transfigure us from the inside. The word transfigure here, okay, is the same, it comes from the same Greek word where you could all say metamorphosis. And we know a caterpillar uh, changes from the inside out. And basically what God is saying, the more we come to the image of God, the more he helps us so that the real you that he designed on the inside begins to come out. The nearer you walk with God, the more like God you become. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is what you call a mountaintop experience when you spend time with God. It's like... How many, how many of you have children who are, let's say, between 12 to 19? Okay? Do you notice that when they make friends, if they spend time with their friends, they begin to get some of the traits of their friends? They develop their own expression. They develop their own language. And so what I'm saying? They have their own gimmicks. When, you know, they take selfies, they have certain gestures that they only have. Right? The more you walk with someone, the more you become like that someone. Especially if you're walking with someone with a strong personality. Okay? Okay? And basically, this is what God is saying. Spend more time with Him. Okay? Spend more time with Him. And as you continue to spend time with Him, you become more and more like Him. Now it says here, in the, in, in the Holy Scriptures, I can't even get out of this part. He says, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, now take note of this. Elijah appeared, I understand Elijah. Elijah did not die. We heard it in the first reading, right? A chariot from heaven. Elijah and Elisha, they were walking along, and then a chariot from heaven came down, swooped down, okay, and took Elijah. You cannot find that in Grab or Uber. <laughs> but praise be to God, it swooped Elijah, Elijah saw him taken up to heaven. So we know Elijah was one of the guys who did not die. There's another one who did not die. Remember who the guy is in Genesis? Enoch. But that's a different reading. The thing was, he walked with God for 600 years. He walked with God. And he became so much like God. And he absorbed the energy, the glory of God that he just took one step from this world into the next. Elijah was one of those who was taken away, and he did not die. So I'd, I'd understand if, uh, you know, Elijah would start appearing there. But then there's this other guy, Moses. Now, did Moses die or not? Hello? Did he die or not? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Okay? He died, as a matter of fact, God said to him, uh, appoint this guy, Joshua, is going to be your, uh, he's going to be the one that would follow you. He would inherit your leadership, your authority, okay? 
And as they cross into the promised land, uh, Moses, you can't cross because you did not obey my instructions here. And then Moses says, Lord, peace, love. <laughs> no, that's not exactly what he said. The Lord says, uh, look, told you already you can't cross over. I gave my, however, go up on this mountain and you will see when they start crossing. And then he died. Okay? So we know that Moses is dead. So who's this guy with Elijah that's ministering to Jesus? Is this the same Moses of the Old Testament? Huh? Hello? You'll not be struck by lightning if you do not answer correctly. We are interactive. Okay? Is this the same Moses of Exodus? Yes, he is. But take note, he's very much alive. The question is, who can see him? Only Jesus? Take note, this is what I'm saying. We are living at a time where the kingdom of heaven is beginning to crash into our world. We're living at a time where the invisible is beginning to manifest in the visible world. Here we find a glimpse of that. Because this was not happening in heaven. This was happening on a real mountain that is situated on earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? And as we ascend before the Lord our God, will become so sensitive, many of us will not only sense or perceive, but some of us might even see some of the things of the invisible world. When the kingdom of God begins to manifest, because this is part of God's plan, before Jesus Christ comes back again, it will not be unusual that people would begin to see, let's say, angels. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? So we need to understand this, church. As we ascend to God, we become more and more like Him. And it begins to open our eyes and our minds that we begin to see the invisible world. There is an invisible world. There is what we call the spirit realm. This is the reason why faith works. This is the reason why prayer works. This is the reason why uh, the confession of the word of God works. Some people say, you mean say, I only say words? Well, that's how God created everything. And you don't see how the confession of God, the confession of the word works, unless your eyes are open in the realm of the spirit. You understand what I'm saying? Let's say you're praying for something. Let's say you need some money, don't have money. And you pray to God, oh God, I need some finances to pay for this thing. And your word says that you would supply my every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I ask that you would supply this need right now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, if God suddenly drops money there, that's fine. But normally he doesn't, right? And when you open your eyes, you look around, you don't see anything. And if you try to be quiet for a while and try to see, it seems like nobody heard your prayer. Because you do not see any activity going on around you. Do you understand what I'm saying? But if God would open your spiritual eyes and ears, you would see your prayers ascending like incense before the throne of the Father. You will find that your prayers are traveling much faster than the souls of the faithful departed. Those who die and go to heaven, your prayers travel much faster than them. You will find that your prayers ascend before the heart of the Father. You will find activity coming down from heaven to earth. Angels being active, moving at the sound of your words. You'll find that if your spiritual eyes have been opened. But even if they're not open, God gave us his word to give us the assurance things are working. Amen? Because it says here, suddenly Elijah, where's Elijah? In heaven. And Moses, where's Moses? He died and he went to heaven. And then his clothes became shining. 
That's glory inside. And you know what? Jesus is living inside of us. And the more we yield to Jesus, the more the glory will come forth. When Moses went into the tabernacle and he was in the presence of God, the light of God just came into his face. And I don't know how to explain it, but the pores of his skin absorbed the light of God that when he exited the tabernacle, it says there that the Jews could not look at him because his face was shining. But then after a while, uh, the radiance, the glory began to fade. Okay? Because our skin, our bodies made of flesh, cannot hold on to it strongly. But you, you know what? Jesus is now inside of us. The glory is there. And the more we yield, the more we begin to shine. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? How many of you are learning from this? Okay. Oh boy. I know how to finish. I'll, I'll finish this. Uh, second thought, heed the word of God, verse 5 to 7. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And because he did not know what to say, for they greatly, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. In other words, this was not something that was normal. And take note, it was not just Jesus seeing this. Peter was there, James and John were there, and they're seeing the same thing, okay? They're seeing the invisible becoming manifest right in front of them. They're seeing the visible. They still see the mountains. They still see Jesus who was there in the flesh. But now they were seeing the invisible, Elijah and Moses lives in heaven they don't have this well Moses at least doesn't have a physical body and yet now Peter was seeing them when the kingdom of heaven begins to come okay and, and, and this was such a new thing with Peter. he didn't know what to do it's according to the Holy Scriptures he he was afraid what is this and he just had to say something and he says, uh, uh, Master, uh, we'll, 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 we'll make uh, three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, and, 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 and one for Moses. Did he not know that Elijah and Moses had better houses in heaven? Did he not know that they had bigger rooms? Did, not, did he not know that they had supernatural houses there in heaven? Of course he did. This was a new experience for him, seeing the invisible. Okay, so he had to say that and then the father spoke. He says, this is my beloved son. It's only him. In other words, don't put him on the same level as these guys. This is my beloved son. Elijah is a prophet. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies. Moses brought the law. The law demanded that we become righteous. But the Lord did not give us the means to become righteous. Jesus is the righteousness of God. That when we put our faith in him, the requirements of the law are met in him. Do you understand what I'm saying? He says, this is my beloved son. You should hear him. What's it saying to us? We should heed the word of of God. God is not giving us his word just to entertain us. God is giving us his word that we might be able to live out the principles of God on the earth. Amen? Okay, let's uh, finish this thing. Uh, third point, bring his presence, purposes, principles, and power to the world. Verse 8 to 9. It says here, suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one anymore. 
Suddenly they couldn't see the invisible anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one about the things that they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This was, uh, this was uh, privileged information. Uh, it was something that was given for a future time. It was something that was given for a people, a, resurrec a resurrection kind of people, a Eucharistic kind of people. But you know what? Even though Jesus Christ had not yet died, even though Jesus Christ had not yet risen from the dead, they were given that glimpse. The Bible tells us there will be a people on the earth who will be able to taste the powers of the age to come. And these are people who would stay with God. See, God has secrets. And he reveals his secrets to those who would remain loyal, faithful, and close to him. That's why we need to ascend before God. The Eucharist is one form of ascending. Another form of ascending is meeting God in your quiet time. Another form of ascending is applying the principles and the purposes of God wherever you, wherever you are. It could be the school, the marketplace, wherever you are. Be like Christ into the world. Let the invisible become visible to them as you live out the life of Christ in the world. Amen. I hope you learned something. Praise God.